This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak with the band Dead 27s. We talk about their new album that's just coming out, The Fear of Failure, Life on the Road, and Effortless Mastery. Enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor. I'm delighted today to have an entire band on the show, almost an entire band, three-fifths three quor- three of a band, the Dead 27s. We have uh, Wallace, Oliver, and Daniel from the band, the Dead 27s, and they're a Charleston-based rock and soul band. Their new album, Ghosts Are Calling Out, is produced by Ben Elman of Funk Rock at Galactic and mixed by Mikhail Count Eldridge, whose other credits include Radiohead and the Rolling Stones. There's a pretty prestigious company there. Indie music magazine Jamsphere said of the band, anyone who claims that rock and soul ain't what it used to be clearly hasn't heard these stunning musicians. This will remind you of soul and blues from the late 60s with rock from the early 70s. But probably the most compelling quality of the Dead 27s is how seamlessly they stay true to the pure old school rock and soul sounds while making their music cutting edge relevant to today's listeners. So it's my pleasure. Welcome, guys. Hey, Hey, thank you. James, thank you, man. So share with our listeners what's going on in your world just now. What's been happening? Well, just uh, finishing up, uh, getting this album finally packaged and and and, and ready uh, to send out. Um, so uh, we've just been real excited about that, uh, getting the tour dates together for the fall uh, to support the uh, album as well. So. And I noticed this is a you're doing this initially as a crowdfunding campaign through through Pledge. Is this the first time you've done a, a crowdfunding campaign? And if so, what was the experience like? Uh, it is, and Pledge Music has been great uh, helping us with ideas, uh, getting together all the bundles, and uh, really f- uh, figuring out ways to to reach our core audience and uh, to involve them and have them engaged in the process. So it's been a real uh, cool experience. And how did you? How did you all meet? What was? How did you all kind of uh, hook up and start playing together? Did you? Uh, is anyone? Where did you kind of all learn your 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 craft? I suppose as well as musicians. Uh, well, um, Miles and I actually grew up in the same town and went to uh, I guess high school at high schools on the opposite side of the town. Um, and then we played with the band together uh, called the Freeloaders for a while. Um, I guess during college days and a little bit after. And uh, Daniel and I actually played some gigs with us there. Um, and Wallace and Will, actually, our other guitar player, uh, lived together in Columbia while they were going to uh, the University of South Carolina. So they kind of had a connection. Um, and then we actually got asked to uh, to play this, this like festival that one of our buddies puts on at a local venue down here called The Poor House. And, uh, Will uh, came down and brought Trey. They uh, they know each other from Greenville, South Carolina, um, and just had, kind of had like a, a great time on that gig, and uh, decided to keep it moving, and ended up uh, bringing in uh, Daniel, Will, and Trey, and uh, full time, and kind of started working uh, working together after that. So, on that very first uh, time that you rehearsed together and you performed together. Did you kind of sense that this was this was a good combination, or did, did it really click right from the get go? Uh, well, there was there wasn't a rehearsal before that one. I <laughs> it was straight to the gig. <laughs> yeah, but it was a lot of fun. I definitely, uh, I mean, I, I guess I can't speak for everybody, but I definitely felt like there was a you know a feel immediately on stage that it was nice and comfortable, and we had a lot of fun, and it was something that uh, we could pursue in the future. Uh, you know, kind of keep it rolling in a direction that like uh, for me at least and then this this latest album you've you went uh, you kind of went to a different part of the country to record it as well so you went to living living room studios you know great studio in uh, new orleans as well what what was the reasoning behind going uh, going to the south and going and recording it down in new orleans well, the main reason is that uh, our producer, Ben Elman, uh, wanted to do that. Uh, ben lives down in New Orleans, and uh, I think you mentioned before he plays in Galactic, and they were off from touring at the time, 
And, uh, you know, he knows the living room studio down there. He knows uh, the people that work in that studio. And he just, uh, he was really comfortable with that and suggested that we come down there and uh, kind of work with his folks as opposed to him coming up and working with ours. So we were happy to, uh, to take his advice on that. And and did the, the did the whole kind of New Orleans kind of vibe? Did it did it kind of it, it, did it kind of seep into your into the music you were doing as well? New Orleans obviously is, is known for obviously the jazz thing as well, but it's also outside of jazz. It's kind of got this. It has a kind of it has a sound. It has a kind of thing to it. Did, did that seep into the album? Um, you know, it New Orleans definitely has a sound to it. I, I wouldn't say that. That uh, old timey New Orleans sound, or even the meter sound, necessarily um, seeped in in a super evident way. But being down there, you just can't help but feel some of those grooves. I know when we were going through uh, some of these tunes, one in particular, a song called "Only One," the groove that we originally had on the demo was significantly different than what we ended up using. Uh, ben suggested. Uh, we use kind of a drum a drum pattern from an old Alan Toussaint song. He had just passed when we were down there. They actually had his funeral when we were in town. So stuff like that, yeah, I mean, I guess it's all over the album. I don't know if you would think of this as a New Orleans sound. But yeah, there's there's influence there. So is it is it Sasserac? That's the that's the liquor down there, isn't it? Did that did that seep a little bit into the recording? Is it Sasserac? Is that the is that the? the I, I actually can't remember in in uh, in South Carolina. What is your is your bourbon? Is it bourbon of choice or what's your liquor of choice there? Uh, definitely lots of bourbon. Uh, uh, primarily, I mean, I don't know. There, there's some local bourbon down here called Virgil Cane. There's also you know. Maker's Mark and all that stuff. I'm definitely familiar with Sazerac, that old, old timey, uh, old fashioned. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's like the New Orleans version, of the old fashioned. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can't get the uh, absent though, like you guys can. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have the serious stuff here. We have the whiskey. I'm, I'm actually speaking to you from Scotland today as well, so we have the we have some pretty he- heavy duty uh, stuff here. So so let's take us to the when you were starting to work on on the record before you're actually going into the studio when you were working on the songs itself. Where did some of the, the the song ideas come from? Where did you kind of find inspiration for the album? Um, well, most of the songs uh, were written over the course of a year or so prior to us going down there and, and starting the recording process. Um, it's it's not really a concept album, so there's not one sort of uh, theme that's spread throughout all the songs where they're just sort of looking at one thing from different perspectives or whatever. Most of the songs are just really based about um, experiences or um, sentiments that, you know, we, we felt during that year trying to get these songs together. Um, so I guess there is a little bit of connection uh, really through, you know, time. You can see sort of those experiences and they are relevant to us as people. But, um, you know, there wasn't one major point of emphasis or theme for the album. And then what about you? You were using some kind of interesting uh, kind of gear, amps and different things on this recording as well. Did, did that play a part in, in the kind of overall sound or did you kind of go in, you, you had a really kind of clear idea what you wanted things to sound like or the, and, you know, the, the gear was the gear, but it didn't really add anything to what you were trying to do. No, I mean, we're, we're pretty much a bunch of gearheads. That's the fun for us. Uh, I, you know, we definitely did a lot of planning before we went down there. I know for, for my guitar tracks, at least, I definitely had an idea of what guitar, what amp I wanted to use, and kind of what I was going for. But, you, you know, you also have to realize that your expectations on that, um, you know, things can be different in different rooms. you got to be flexible, too. So we tried to be organized so that we're not wasting time, at least know where we wanted to start. But yeah, I mean, all the different gear that was in there. I know Ben brought, uh, one, one of the items he brought was an old like video projector that had been modified, um, you know, because those old video projectors had tubes and, and uh, circuits in them that were very similar to uh, amplifier circuits. So they just took some old video projector and made it into an amp. And, uh, you know, we ended up putting that on there. Obviously, we couldn't have uh, foreseen something like that. You just kind of get inspired when certain toys pop up. But So I guess a mix of those things would be a good answer. And then this is a kind of question for, for each, either individually or for, or whoever wants to take it, really. But um, 
can you just kind of talk, as songwriters and as musicians as well can you just kind of tell our listeners about maybe a time when you were working on a, a creative project and you gave it your all you you gave it your heart and your soul but for whatever reason it just didn't work out like you'd hoped and more importantly what were the lessons that you you took away from that experience hmm <laughs> That's a tough one. I mean, I, I guess I would say uh, when we when we first wrote the the tunes for the for the first album and put that out, that's kind of everything we gave everything. You know, we had it all. We we had six tunes of original music and we put it all on that one EP and uh, got a lot of praise for it. Got a lot of uh, critical acclaim for it on the local press and and then you know we had to do a follow up and it's like, well, we have to do this as good as we did the first time. And, uh, you know, some of the songs may have fallen short, you know, that we uh, started writing, you know, afterwards. And, and, you know, we might not necessarily realize that, but, we, you know, we, st- we road test them and, and uh, kind of get some feedback from, from different, um, you know, fans that are hardcore fans of ours. And, and also working pre-production part with Ben. And, uh, I mean, we had like 20, 25 songs that we had written for the album. And, and you know, we started whittling them down. Uh, based on those uh, scenarios, so I guess uh, you know to answer the questions, like we kind of you know not every song is the is going to be the best song. And I think that's the one thing we all experience as a band together. It's kind of like, well, all right, this one might not might not be as good as we really thought it was. So is that oh. fair? Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess I can add on that. Daniel's kind of specific there. I'll be more general. I mean, I feel like overall and any development of any musician you're going to experience a lot of failure um and that's kind of key to being able to accomplish what you want is being able to I, I guess not necessarily accept it but be able to take a step back and kind of use what you failed at as motivation to drive you to, to achieve whatever you're trying to achieve and that you know it's kind of a constant struggle i feel like uh like I said, I feel like any musician that's that's you know tried to really do it has probably gone through a lot of that and has gotten used to uh, gotten used to feeling beat down every once in a while, but knows how to I guess kind of persevere through that and use that as motivation. Yeah, James, it's it's, it's kind of funny, man. It, it sort of comes back to those expectations, uh, at least for me. Um, there were definitely songs where you know we might have wanted it to be one thing but the song for some reason or another wanted to be something else um to, to be an optimist uh you know i wouldn't look at that necessarily as, as a failure sometimes it's like we're trying to push that square peg through the round hole and after you do that long enough you realize that you know just let it be a round peg but it's a really good round peg you could be upset about that or you could just recognize that maybe it didn't turn out how you wanted but it's good where it is so I think we experienced a little of that too. And what was the role of uh, of Ben on on the on the record? I mean, what what did Ben as a producer bring that you don't think would have been there if you'd maybe self if you'd you know produced the album yourself? Well, I would say um, from the drummer's perspective, uh, you know, he there may be certain grooves that he wanted to try different stuff with. Um, there was like uh, that Alan Toussaint feel that we had uh, that he brought up for um, only one. It was a, uh, he brought in a Yes, you, yes We Can, um, the Pointer Sisters version. And uh, it was, wasn't something that I really, I never would have even thought to do that. Um, he also did it, you know, we tried some faster tempos, tried some slower tempos. So he, you know, he was kind of that fifth or that, not fifth member, but sixth member. I'm singing like the fifth Beatle. Beatles. Yeah, <laughs> he's like the sixth member of uh, you know the band that that's the outside perspective um, that can kind of hear it with a fresh ear, and uh, was able to do that. So so from from the drumming perspective, uh, and the, you know that's really how he helped. Was that was, was that a little bit intimidating as, as a drummer because obviously he's working with like Stanton Moore and you know like one of the most best drummers around as well who who has a certain kind of sound and everything. So, was were you intimidated in that first day when you were kind of going in there and playing those tunes to him? No, nah, man, I, I really welcomed it. Um, I'm very open to. I like to, you know surrounding myself with people like Ben and uh, and and even Stanton. We've opened up for them a couple times, so just just being around that whole vibe um, 
you know, it humbles you, but at the same time, it's a learning experience. Um, so, I mean, I may have been a little nervous. It's just, uh, I think uh, I perform, I, I like performing in that situation so that I can, it helps me grow as a drummer and it uh, helps the band grow as well. That's, that's one reason why we, you know, sought out a producer and especially if somebody of his caliber, so. And in, in this journey that you, you've been kind of taking over the years, like through this album, through the previous album, and also like all the stuff that kind of got you to kind of where you, where you are today, um, can you talk, tell our listeners about any any insights or kind of those kind of light bulb moments maybe in your lives individually where you've kind of – something's just kind of clicked and you've, you've kind of known, okay, this is maybe the direction you need to be taking with the music or what the band was doing or, 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 or something just creatively you knew you need to be going in a certain direction. Can you, any of you talk to, about that, that light bulb, the, those insights that you've had? Um, well, uh, for me personally, um, I'd say that light bulb moment went out with, with the band – when we first all clicked together and, and, and wrote the first song. Um, as a drummer, it was really when I experienced playing in front of an audience for the first time and uh, heard the crowd you know, roar, and, and it was just like a bug I couldn't get rid of. I wanted to experience that over and over. Um, but uh, overall, it's just always been something that I've known I wanted to do, and, 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 uh, and I'm really blessed that I've been able to keep doing it. Uh, Oliver, you want to go? I guess we we'll each answer. Uh, sure. Um, I, I guess for me, definitely uh, an individual. Daniel kind of said something that, that reminded me. You know, definitely getting on stage for the first time is something that I, I guess can push you one way or the other. Either you really, really enjoy it and can't get enough of it forever, or it might push you the opposite direction. Um, so that, that definitely, I think, plays a role for for anyone that's you know a live musician. Uh, and I, I kind of feel the same way about um, about the band. We were talking about that. Uh, we were talking about the first night we played that was kind of thrown together. And uh, I I definitely remember feeling like that was something different than I was accustomed to of late, like groups that I played with, and just had like a lot of a lot of energy surrounding it. And uh, definitely, I think made everyone consider. You know, looking at that group in a, in a different in a different way than probably we we went into that that night thinking it was going to be. You know, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say everybody's kind of nailed it as far as uh, the first time that we got together and wrote songs. That was a special moment. That's a hard thing to do uh, with people. You know, for the first time, you don't know how that's going to work out, and when it works out well, it it means something to you, and you recognize that it is special. Um. Me personally, as a musician, you know, the light bulb moments are they're, they're kind of difficult sometimes, just because when you're in this thing as as heavy as I guess you are, as we are at least, when you're doing this full time or whatever, you're just so immersed in it that um, sometimes you sort of forget the light bulb moments. But I know I had one when I was in college. I, I think I went to a uh, Berkeley School of Music for a summer and played at their giant performance center with a combo and. And, and something I got asked to do, and I remember being really terrified before I went on stage that night because I knew there was nothing but students and teachers out there, and they all hated me. Every single one of them was probably wishing that they were up there. But after that moment, I knew I would never be scared again of a stage. I had no stage fright, and I don't think I've had it since. So it was a really cool feeling walking off that stage and going, wow, this is going to be nothing but fun from now on. I'll never be scared for no reason. And it's funny you mentioned Berkeley. I mean, I've got a lot of friends who have gone through Berkeley and who teach at Berkeley as well. But there's there's that thing of like some of the best musicians I know went to Berkeley but never completed their their, pro, their degree program. By the time they got to year two, they were so busy as musicians they they went out. Like I, in fact, last week I was in New York and it was Mike Stern and and so Mike was one of those guys who like I think went through it and then left. And there was another young guy, Julian Large, wonderful, great young jazz guitarist. I think he was the same. He does his year two years and then he gets picked up and you start you start touring as as well so so i congratulate you at least on having managed to get through an entire summer there without leaving <laughs> or playing there well that, you know i went uh, in south carolina and i always just wanted to spend my summers doing as much music as i could so there's no way you could get me out of that place <laughs> 
So, and what's some of the best advice that you've all received about being musicians and ha- having a having a career and having some success and and uh, enjoying being musicians and and, uh, and performers? Um, I guess I'll start on that. I, I don't know if there's necessarily like a quote. There's not really one person that I would attribute this advice to, but sort of a um, a piece of advice that I, I feel like I've seen from a lot of different sources from a lot of different people. Uh, two things. Um, number one, don't let uh, fear of failure keep you from trying. Uh, it's so important to recognize that you know you shouldn't be protecting your ego um, at the compromise of your growth like make sure you're out there giving it your best and if you fail that's just sort of part of the process Uh, another thing um would probably be that you're you know you're going to get some failure everybody you know that's been extremely successful has a million stories they can tell you about doors that have been slammed in his or her face so you know be ready for that um embrace it um let's see uh I think uh, the most the one that pops in my head immediately is just uh, I guess when we started really seriously touring and stuff. There's a lot of a lot of great bands in town that uh, that that have you know kind of hit the road really hard. And speaking with those guys, everybody kind of had similar sen- sentiments. So like, make sure that uh, you kind of overrate or bear that da- bear down on the road and keep your head up basically because there was it was going to turn into a grind at some point and just make sure you don't lose sight of you know, why you're doing this and that it's actually something we love and it's uh you know it's a it's a labor of love basically and that kind of you know is paraphrasing several several people that kind of have reiterated that I do think it's very very important that you don't uh, lose sight of, of like, why you're doing it because it, it definitely can be a grind out there um, but in the end you're doing something you love and it's fun you just gotta definitely remember that yeah, I feel like they both hit that uh, on the head. Just uh, don't be feel, fe- don't fear failure. That's the the main thing, and you, it's a learning experience when you do. And just uh, uh, you keep going as, as and be inspired. It's the main thing. A, a good friend of mine, um, uh, Andy Hall, is a dobro player in a band called the Infamous String Dusters. Um, a great, and I remember him saying, I think that by this point the band had been maybe out on the road like for two years, like nonstop. They were just touring nonstop. Um, and I think I made, he, he, he speaking to me about that point of just kind of getting to the like, why, why are we doing this? You know, it was a real hard, hard, hard grind as well. But just kind of then breaking through that. And I think now the band's in its maybe fourth or fifth year and they're doing, they're doing great, great stuff as well. So, you're just about to um, hit the road, obviously. In, in the, in the, I think it's, you said it, you hit the road in the fall and all to promote the album and and, and do anything. Um, any tips for those artists out there? And actually, not just musicians, but obviously we have a lot of people who are like public speakers and they're they're out on the road doing doing things. And any uh, any touring, any battle tips for <laughs> you know surviving life on the road, especially when you're out for you know a long period of time. Yeah, stay healthy. No fast food. Yeah, I mean, that's it's really all about taking care of yourself. Um, it's definitely a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, you know, you got to stay optimistic. Um, re- remember how special it is to have these opportunities to get out there and see different places. Don't take it for granted. Um, that's that's really about all I'd have to say. I mean, it's, you know, it's a romantic American dream out there on the road, being in a van, playing on the <laughs> But it's, 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 it's funny, actually. It's, um, I had a previous guest on, an, an artist I used to manage many years ago, Tommy Emmanuel, <clears throat> who's a, guitar, a guitarist. And um, he's he, he plays like 300 shows a, a year, some ridiculous number of shows. And his thing now that he swears by is, I think it's his Nutribullet, which basically follows him everywhere on the road. It's always sitting backstage. And that he's just like juicing the whole time because you're just playing so intensively all the time. Yeah. Yeah, well, it makes sense. But everybody you know that's out there a lot ends up with these really quirky habits about like yoga or diet or sleep or hydration or something. Everybody figures their own little specific thing out, but you know, whatever works. And do you have, you're about to hit the road just now as well. I know you, you, you guys, you've been using uh, Pledge Music for the crowdfunding side of things. 
Uh, are there any online resources or tools or apps that either individually you really love using or as a band you've been using a lot to kind of get your message out there? I mean, it's really been all the social media stuff. You know, Facebook has been huge. Um, the email list, uh, Twitter, and, and Instagram as well. Um, those have been great tools to be able to connect and engage with the audience. Um, there's also, I think, a new thing that we're trying out called the Superphone, uh, where people have a phone number and, and they're able to communicate by text with us. Um, I think that's something new that's, that, that we're working with. So there's lots of great ways that we've been able to communicate with the audience. Uh, Pledge Music has been another, you know, example of just having that fan interaction and, and you know, keeping up with everybody that that's in, wants to, you know, know what the band's doing and what's going on and and then engage, you know, with us. And then, what about when you're on on the road? How do you kind of capture those ideas that come up? And how, how do you do you get a chance to record things while you're on the road, or do you have something uh, tools that you're using, apps that you're using, in order to kind of catch capture those ideas so you don't lose them? Oh. Um, we take Pro Tools with us on the road a good bit of the time. Um, we'll set up in hotel rooms and put down song ideas. I know that we've all used, uh, we, we all have iPhones and stuff, and they have little uh, voice memos and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, anything you can do to catch it when the lightning strikes. Um, but yeah, obviously the best one is use the real equipment like your Pro Tools and stuff. It doesn't get much better than that. Okay, question here just as we start to finish up as well. And this is unusual because normally I don't have three guests on at all at the same time as well. So this is interesting. So please, can you recommend to our listeners one record and one book each? One record and one book each that you think our listeners should check out. You think that they would just, they would inspire them, they would blow them away, would just kind of turn their, turn their heads a bit. Um, I'm going to say Effortless Mastery, the book by Kenny Werner. Um, it's uh, an amazing uh, look at how to practice and how to uh, kind of get out of your own head and and, and uh, grow as a musician. Uh, but it can also be used in all different forms of, of what you go go through with life. Um, that was a big inspiration. Um, I, re, I reread it uh, every couple years or so and, and always come away with something else uh, new from it. So... Um, for the album, I mean, like a desert island pick. Whew. man, there's like three that come to the top. Of, come to the top. So I guess the one that inspired me most when I was youngest as a player. Uh, I'm gonna say All My Brothers Live at the Fillmore East, um, just because as the the drumming uh, that's on that uh, and, and hearing the interaction with the band and how they play off of one another and the uh, improvisation that they do um, was a big inspiration to me and in and more in the years where I was growing most as a musician. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess I'll go album first since Daniel went book first. Um, man, talking Desert Island, man, it really makes you think. Uh, my, my gut instinct was uh, John Schofield Uber Jam because I can listen to that album all the time over and over again. It never really gets old. I feel like that's a really great album that can keep you entertained for an extended period of time. Um, God, the book one's tough, too. I guess I'll try and go with like a musical area book. Um, actually, one I'm thinking of, while it's actually Let Me Bar, is... Uh, uh, I love the, it's a, the book about the composition of Love Supreme with John Coltrane, and it's uh, the, the part I liked about it is uh, how it described like what a process and what what a like uh, labor it was to to do to produce something of, of that magnitude, um, and it probably didn't uh, resound with me when I first read it, but definitely it's, the more we get into it, that one kind of you know, sticks with me, I would say. Um, let me think here. As far as books, uh, really, I, I, I know I shouldn't throw two out there, but I think that it's kind of the, uh, the disparity between the two that sort of shows the lesson. If you read, like, Eric Clapton's autobiography and then Nikki Sixes, <laughs> um, <laughs> you learn a good bit about this thing, actually. Like, and Clapton's is so cool because 
you know, for me, I'm sitting here thinking, this is Clapton. He's like a god. This thing's going to be crazy. I can't wait to see these stories. But then you end up reading it, and I, I felt after it that, like, man, he's a pretty normal dude. It, like, the ride got a little crazy with substance abuse, but the rest of it, and who knows, maybe he just kept it really close to his chest. He didn't tell all. But um, it seemed like, wow, this is actually a really normal person. That was kind of an epiphany for me. And then the very flip side of that coin is you read Nikki Sixes. And <laughs> it's almost like a lesson in what not to do. And it's almost like, wow, it was way crazier than I thought it could be. So, you know, you kind of get to see that there's a lot of illusion both directions in this game. I think it's kind of cool to, to, to have those in opposition of each other. Um, Music-wise, I know for me, um, I mean, like, I think it was like the second Roy Buchanan album is really special. I think that's the one that has Messiah Will Come Again on it. Um, Hendrix Band of Gypsies, I know you just asked for one, but I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this, is al- this is always hard <laughs> amongst it's- musicians. Yeah, I can't do one. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, <laughs> Hendrix's Band of Gypsies, that machine gun has this one held note in it. I think it's like a like a bent A to a B or something, bending up to the fifth, but I've just he just holds it. And I've seen so many interviews from like Miles Davis to Trey Anastasio, like everybody seems to point to this one bent note that he holds in machine gun and just as like a perfect expression of like a musical thought with very little flair. It's very raw, very authentic. Um, you know, that, that that raw authenticity I think is the hardest thing to uh, to keep in your playing. And, and but it's also the most important. Trying to get back to that root is what it's all about. And a final question for you. Let's imagine if uh, you woke up tomorrow morning and you had to start from scratch. So you've got all the tools of the trade, you've got all your gear, all the instruments and everything, all the knowledge and all the the chops and everything you've acquired as musicians over the years, but no one knows who you are, you know no one, you have no contacts. How would you restart? Uh, I guess I would start by going out to a uh, show to, to get some contacts phone numbers, and then I would start making phone calls to put a band together. Um, from there, get everyone together and learn some cover tunes that we're all influenced by and see how the band gels and, you know, start taking off from there, like asking about if they have any original stuff they want to pitch and yeah, the first step would be going out and meet musicians. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's <laughs> where you start. I was, I was going to say, just go out and get involved in the local music scene and, uh, Go see as much music as you can and start to develop contacts and see if you can't find some like-minded individuals that, like Daniel said, might have some some cover tunes in common to get you started. And then, uh, you know, just carry through that process one step at a time and try and, you know, you already know, we already know how to do it. It's just, you know, a stepwise process and not becoming inundated with trying to do everything at once. Um, just basically set out a, a game plan or a formula and do your best to execute it. Um, I would probably say, you know, if you have all the tools, you're starting out, uh, not necessarily what would I do different, but I, I do think that I would probably focus heavier on original music earlier than I did. Um, it seems like, you know, when you're coming through, like I know most of us really started playing live in college, and it's so easy to just kind of you know, be the golden god at those gigs with the cover band catalog and just keep it easy and just love it. And it's, you know, it's like Bruce Springsteen's glory days um, (laughs) personified, basically. Uh, And that's great. And, you know, everybody can do that. Um, It gets way harder when you're trying to introduce people to your own thoughts, your own feelings, what you're trying to say. Um, and you know, I feel like I was personally a little timid doing that up until it was kind of like, all right, no, we're doing this. This is where it's going. We have to get over it or I have to get over it. Um, it it would be cool to see what was happening if I hit that point a little earlier. 
Great. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming on the show. I know you've got the the, the, um, the pledge music campaign that's just kind of kicked off. Um, by the time people hear this, it'll probably be a couple of weeks into the campaign as, as well. So share with our listeners what's the best way that they can connect with you as a band and also to pledge music and to uh, hopefully go and catch the band live. Um, they really and truly the easiest way is to go to uh, dead27s.com and all of uh, our social media and the Pledge Music Campaign connects from there. Um, Facebook is uh, facebook.com slash dead27s. Twitter is the same and Instagram is the same. Um, our Pledge Music uh, website is pledgemusic.com slash dead27s. Uh, but again, all of those links are on our webpage at dead27s.com. Well, guys, thanks so much for coming on the show. I wish you all the best with the with the new album as it comes out, and, and also when you hit the road as well. That long tour <laughs> you're gonna you've got coming up to start promoting it. Thanks for coming on the show, guys. All right, thank you so much. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.